Hello church family. Uh, I want to welcome you to the return of our life study groups. Uh, this will be uh, virtual as naturally you can you can tell and I hope you will will join us over the next eight weeks as we begin the study of uh, the the letter of James from the New Testament. Um, in beginning a, a, a study of any book of the Bible is something like preparing for a trip. Um, Teresa, my wife, and I were, were blessed to be able to go to Utah last fall and, and, and visit five different national parks. And leading up to that, she spent a lot of time uh, in preparing for that, whether it was looking um, at the internet uh, about the different sites for each park or reading books on those parks or talking to people that had been to the parks themselves. And uh, the reason for that, the purpose for that, was so that we could enjoy the visit more once we got there because we would know what we were looking for and how to get there. And that's the same way that, that I feel that, that you um, begin a, a Bible study, is to look for what you want to find. And to do that, how we're gonna do that this morning, or the day, is uh, to spend time answering four different questions that you would ask for any, any Bible study that you, that you look at. And before we get into that, let me uh, lead us in a word of prayer and, and ask the Lord to, to bless our time together. Father, I exalt you today and I just thank you so much for who you are. Father, I pray your Holy Spirit upon this time today that you will bless us with, with your presence. Lord, that you will open our hearts and open our eyes to see you and what you want to teach us from your word today. Uh, Father, without you, this is just uh, wasted time. It's time that's spent that will not be beneficial to us. And Lord, that's the, the one thing that I want um, everyone to get out of this study is exactly what you have for us. Father, in teaching us how to become more spiritually mature. Uh, we worship you today. We praise you today. And we just thank you for who you are. And we ask these things in your Son, Jesus Christ's most holy name. Amen. Now, as I mentioned, we're going to spend eight weeks uh, looking at the book of James. And those four questions that, that we need to ask, four important questions that we need to ask, are these. The first one is this. Who was James? Well, we look at the Bible, and the Bible tells us who James was, and and. and chapter 1, verse 1, it says, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. So James was very humble in introducing himself, but still we see that there are several Jameses that are mentioned in the New Testament. Now the name James is, is, comes from uh, the word or the name Jacob, which is very prominent in the, in the Old Testament. Testament. And some of those men that actually bore the name of James, you may remember, uh, one of those was James, which was the brother of John, the disciple whom Jesus loved. And James was a disciple also. Now they were the sons of Zebedee. And you may remember or may recall that Jesus nicknamed these two young men uh, the sons of thunder because of their, uh, their aggression and spiritual um, uh, vigor, so to speak. Okay, but most people don't believe that this is the James that, that actually penned the letter to the New Testament. We also see James, the son of Alphaeus. Now this was the second disciple that was named James. And there's not a lot mentioned about him in the Word um, other than that he was a disciple, so most people don't feel like this was the James as well. And then there was also uh, James, the father of Judas, the disciple. Now, this is not Judas, the one that most of us would, would think about. There were actually two disciples that were named Judas. Of course, Judas Iscariot, the one that betrayed our Savior. And then Judas, um, the son of James. He was called that so that people would understand the difference between the two. But again, he's just not, this is not the James that most people, most uh, uh, Bible scholars attribute the book to. The one that they attribute the book to would be James, the brother of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Of course, we know that, that this James was not a full brother, but a half-brother because he was the son of um, Mary and Joseph, or Jesus was the son of Mary and of God. Now, 
we see that James was a, was a humble man because of the way he introduced himself uh, through the letter. He didn't introduce himself as a brother of Jesus, but as a servant of Jesus. Now, one of the interesting things to me about uh, James was this, is while Jesus walked on the face of the earth, James and his other brothers were not believers. They didn't believe that Jesus was the Messiah, was the great Savior to come. But we see that there was a change, and that change we're told about in Acts 1, 14, and that's because James and his other brothers were actually in the upper room praying. Now, this was after the resurrection of Jesus. So what changed? What, what, what called James to go from unbelief to faith? Well, in 1 Corinthians 15, 7, the Bible indicates to us that James uh, saw Jesus, that Jesus appeared to James after his resurrection and his life was changed forever. Much as my life was changed forever after I met Jesus, much as I hope your life was changed forever after you met Jesus, there's a change in us when we meet the risen Savior. Now James became the leader of the, uh, of the church in Jeru Jerusalem. As a matter of fact, Paul called him a pillar of the church. Uh, other things that we know is when Peter was delivered from prison, James was one of the first people that he asked to see. And then Paul, whenever he came to visit and bring the offering from the, the church of the Gentiles, it was James to who he brought the offering to. Now, we don't have a record in the Bible of uh, how James died, but tradition tells us that he was martyred around A.D. of 62. And it tells us that the Pharisees in Jerusalem, they so hated James because of his testimony of Jesus that they had him thrown down from the temple. And from there, they went on to beat him and murder him with clubs and sticks. Now, the story goes on and continues to tell us how James died, and that is that James died the same way that Jesus, our Savior, died. Well, how is that, Terrell? You just told us that, that James was beaten to death with clubs, and we know that Jesus was crucified on a cross. What was the same was that Jesus prayed for his murderers when he was being crucified. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. James prayed the same prayer over his the folks that were murdering him at the time. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. So what kind of man was James? We can tell from the word that James was a deeply spiritual man, that he, uh, he believed in the power of prayer. He's what we would call today a prayer warrior. Uh, James was so deeply involved in prayer that um, he was said to have the knees of a camel and that they were calloused up and scarred up because he spent so much time on his knees in front of the Lord. Man, I'd like for people to know, know me as that guy, as a guy that has knees like camels. I'm sure you would too. And we'll also see that James was deeply passionate about prayer because we'll see this emphasis in many occasions of the book of James as, as we go through it. Also, James, while he was still an unbeliever, spent a lot of time uh, with Jesus and listening to his sayings and the reason that we know that is because a lot of the the scripture that James writes in his letter alludes to the sayings of Jesus particularly those sayings when it was this, when Jesus preached his sermon on the mount we'll see that in five or six different occasions in the book where you can almost compare the the, the language word for word where Jesus preached the sermon on the mount and James is teaching in his book now I want you to keep in mind that that James was the leader of the church in, in Jerusalem during a, a very difficult time. It was a time of transition. And those times of transition uh, are always, are usually upsetting and they're demanding. Okay? So, we see, that gives us a glimpse of who G James was. The second question we need to ask then is this, to whom did James write his letter? So who was James writing? Let's go back to the Word of God to see who James was writing to. And that's the, uh, the last part of verse 12. And it says, To the twelve tribes in the dispersion, greetings. So James was writing to the twelve tribes which had been scattered, scattered abroad. So he was writing to, to the Christians, Jewish Christians that were actually living outside uh, the land of Palestine. So his letter was to the Christian Jews. And we'll see at least nine times in the letter that he addressed him 
as brethren, which indicated not only just uh, brothers in the flesh, but also brothers in, in the Lord as well. Now the, the word scattered in King James is a, is a very interesting word in that it means uh, dispersion. And if you look at the Greek word of it, or the Greek um, uh, translation of it, it carries the idea of scattering seed. And it's really interesting, and, and, and to me it's really neat when you think about what happened. Uh, the Jewish believers were scattered after the death of, of Stephen because they were afraid. But the Lord knew what he was doing because it was as if he was scattering seed among the rest of the earth so that others would be saved and come to know him as their Savior and to bear fruit. So now we know that who James was, whom he wrote his letter to. Now the question is, why did James write that letter? Why was he writing that letter? You know, each, each letter of the New Testament, uh, it's got its own special theme, it's got its own special purpose, and even its own special destination. For example, Paul wrote the book of Romans uh, as he was preparing for his trip to Rome to visit them. He wanted to prepare the way, so to speak, for his visit. Or uh, 1 Corinthians was sent to the church of Corinth because they were experiencing certain problems in the church at the time that needed to be corrected. And then we see that Galatians was also written to a group of churches uh, to warn them uh, against legalism and against false teaching. So each book of the Bible has its own uh, has its own special theme or its own special purpose. And as we read uh, the book of James and as we go through the book of James over the next uh, seven weeks after the day, we're going to see that the Jewish Christians were also experiencing um, problems. Problems in their personal lives and problems in their church fellowship as well. For one thing, they were going through some difficult times or difficult trials. And they were also facing temptations to sin. Some of the uh, religious leaders were catering to the rich. And some people in the church were actually being robbed by the rich. Church members were competing for power in the church, for offices in the church, particularly those offices of, of teaching. But one of the major problems that, uh, that was in the church was a failure on the part of many to live what they professed to believe. We also will see that the tongue was a serious problem. Um, worldliness was another problem that they were experiencing at the time. And as we review this list of problems, um, it doesn't really appear to be much different than what we experience in our churches today. Those same type of problems continue to um, come up against us in, in our churches today. And James wasn't just discussing a, an array of, uh, of miscellaneous problems, scattershotting out, so to speak, uh, just throwing it out there. But every one of these problems had one common cause, and that cause was spiritual immaturity. Christians simply weren't growing up. They were staying as babes in, in, in the walk. Now this gives us a hint to the theme of James's letter. And that theme is this, is the marks of maturity in the Christian life. Now what does that look like, right? What does that look like? What's a, what does that mean? Well, there's two reasons to study the book of James. And the first one is this, is to, to examine the relationship between faith and work. There is a relationship there. And the second one is this, is to the explore, to explore the impact of our faith on the life of the city of Monticello as well as our world. That's the two reasons to, to study the book, of, the book of James. And we'll see that James uses the word perfect several times. And that meaning of that word perfect is mature or complete. And James refers to a perfect man, and he's not referring to a sinless man. But what he is, he's referring to is, is a man that, uh, who is mature, who is balanced, 
who's grown up in his, his spiritual life. And I think you'll agree with me is that spiritual maturity is one of the greatest needs uh, in our churches today, even in our church here at First Baptist. In his case, when James, that James was writing to, he had members that were staying in the, the milk of the word, so to speak. And you know, we know that the milk of the word is, is that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. He's the Savior, and He is the only way that we're able to enter eternity with God. It's through Jesus Christ as our risen Savior. They weren't moving on to uh, the meat and potatoes of the, of, of the Word. They weren't moving on to what a, a, a walk in Him looks like. They were staying in that, in that spiritual milk, shall we say. And the problems that James deals with, we can see that each one of those have the characteristics of children. I'll give you some examples. Uh, they were impatient during their difficulty, difficulties. Sorry, uh, They were talking, but they weren't living out the truth. They didn't have control of their tongue. They were fighting and coveting others' possessions. And then they just collected material toys. All of these things is, is, is what James will speak about to us in, in the coming up lessons that we'll look, like, look at over the next several weeks. As a matter of fact, the five chapters of the book of, of James suggest the five marks of a mature Christian. And that's the way that we're going to look at this, by, uh, at this study as we go through it in the upcoming weeks, is how can we spiritually mature to be the man, to be the woman that the Lord wants us to be? How can we live that out? So we've now seen who James was. We've seen who James wrote to. And we understand now why James wrote the letter. And then the last and the final question that we have to ask is this one. How can I get the most out of this Bible study? Well, we have to do that by beginning by examining our own hearts. We have to look at our own hearts in our, in, in our walk in our Christian life. Now, first of all, it's essential that we're born again. That Jesus is our Savior. And I want to encourage you, if you don't know Jesus as your Savior today, I know there's a number down at the bottom of the screen. And that number you'll be able to call and visit with one of our pastors or one of our staff members or one of our lay people that are able to walk you through what it looks like to have a relationship with Jesus, to, to know Him as your risen Savior so that you can spend eternity with Him. And I'd encourage you to, to, to make that call today and allow... Uh, one of us to walk that walk through you with that. The second essential, after we've been born again, is that we have to examine the Word of God, the written Word of God, in an honest fashion. We have to honestly look at our heart. Now James tells us, uh, or James compares the Bible to a large mirror. Now, uh, as we study the Word, we're looking into that divine mirror to see uh, ourselves as we really are. And James warns us that when we look at that mirror that we have to uh, we have to be honest about what we see and not merely glance at that image and just say hey okay I'm good enough and walk on. Now, the third uh, essential that we'll, we'll look at or we have to look at is that we have to obey what the Word tells us to do, what the Word teaches us no matter what the cost. We have to obey it. And we'll see that because James tells us that we have to not only, that we have to be doers of the Word and not just hearers of the Word, but we have to actually do what it says. Now look, it's easy uh, to sign up for a Bible study. It's actually easy to lead a Bible study with all the material that we have uh, today to help us go through it. It's easy to sit in on it and to make comments. Um, it's easy to do the reading of it. Where the the hard part comes into is actually taking that that we learn from the Bible study and applying it to our everyday lives, whether it's at work or with our families at home or in our whatever else it is that we may be doing. See, the blessing does not come from the studying of the Word, but the blessing comes from the doing of the Word. It's important to understand that, that Christian growth is, is not automatic. It's a uh, it's not like physical growth, okay? Uh, Christian maturity 
is something that, that we must work at constantly. So I want to encourage you, don't give up. Don't give up. Keep pushing forward. Um, we have to measure our spiritual growth by the Word of God. Don't spend your time trying to measure your growth spiritually by that of another Christian. Each of us grow at, at different paces, much like each of us grow different physically. We also grow different spiritually and at different paces. So I want to encourage you, just because you may not be, uh, in your mind, as spiritually mature as the next person is that's been a Christian for a um, shorter time than maybe you have, don't let that get you down. Keep going forward. Keep moving forward. You know, everyone that grows old uh, doesn't necessarily grow up. You know, there's a, there's a difference between age and maturity. And just because a Christian's been saved for 10 or 20 or 50 or even 60 years uh, doesn't guarantee that that person is mature in the Lord. See, mature Christians are happy Christians. They're useful Christians. They want to be used by the Lord. They're the type of Christians that love, that equip, that go and serve. So I hope this uh, makes you want to come back uh, the next few weeks as we, we go through the rest of the book of James. And next week we'll, we'll look at verses 2 through 18 out of chapter 1. And I hope you'll spend some time this week uh, praying over that, reading it, asking God to open uh, your eyes through His Holy Spirit to what He would have us to, to garner from that. And I'd like to leave us uh, today with two things. I want to I want to leave you with my life verse, which is uh, a, a verse that's, that's really near and dear to my heart that speaks to me. And I pray that it will speak to you. And it comes out of the great book of Isaiah. And it's uh, chapter 41, verse 10. And this is the prayer that I pray for you this week. It's fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you, I will help you, and I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. That's my prayer for you this week. Let me pray for you, and we'll see you back here next week. Father, we thank you for the time that we had today together um, and learning just a little bit about the book of James and, and uh, Father introducing it to us. Lord, I just pray for each person that watches this this week that you will bless them, that you will encourage them in a mighty, mighty way. Uh, Father, that you will bless them so that your great name may be known, so that your kingdom may be expanded through all the earth. Father, and that we'll do the things that you have called us to do and to be the people that you've called us to be. Father, we're so grateful for this opportunity, and we just thank you for it so much. Well, I hope to see you next week. And until then, I hope you have a great week.